Sunday. Good. Yes. Okay. It's been recorded. Great. And um, yes, the deadline is this Sunday. If you want to refresh your memory, it's in the October newsletter on page five at the bottom for details what's required. And also, um, Cindy from uh, District 5 sent a reminder for any of you who've been to Merlin, Merlin's Hollow. This Sunday is the last time they, uh, they will be selling plants because they're closing up more or less. So that's, that's the other announcement. Annette? Uh, Annette? Yes? Uh, also, don't forget photo contest. It was a photo contest I wanted to be announced. We would vote to have to be in by this Sunday. So if you haven't voted, please uh, take a look at the pictures I sent out to you and tell me your favorites in each of those categories. Okay, great. Yeah, we've got, yeah, always two items at the same time. Great. Okay, lots, so as, as everybody can see, there's always a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. It's not that we've retired. We're up and, and around all the time. And uh, we're getting 727, a few more minutes. Uh, we've got, we're now up to 26. Hopefully a few more. And- Can I um, ask a question? Yes. Oh, sorry. I just wondered um, of the number of uh, members that you have, how many actually are able to join your Zoom meeting? Like a third, a half? Because uh, we're well, going to look at that option. I just wondered, what's your yes. success rate been? Well, at the moment, we still have about 220 members. And no matter where you go, I found I belong to a few other groups. Percentage-wise, we should have at least half. But as far as Zoom meetings, I've seen it at, with all the others. Uh, that on the average, you don't get that many. Mm. We, we usually get, you know, between 40 and 50. Mm. Uh, I've, I've been with other groups, the same. The percentage wise, it's always a lot less oddly enough. Mm. And it, uh, it proves too, and you know, I get talking, I'm uh, in contact with a lot of members, phone, emails, or in person. It's always the same issue. People would just look at it as a social event. They would just love to come out and meet in person, mm -hmm. enjoy the refreshments, talk to the speaker, you know, mingle. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and this is what people are really, really missing these days. And a lot of people, and, and of course, Sandy does a great write-up on our speakers. So a lot of people say, well, you know, we can't meet, but at least we can, we can read her write-ups mm -hmm. and we know what's going on what the speaker has said, what it was all about. But in, in the truth really is people yeah. would prefer to meet in person. That okay. is the big, big issue. Mm -hmm. Annette, can I comment here? Sure. You know, while, while our membership is over 200, we never got those out to in-person meetings. Our in-person meetings ranged between maybe 80 to 90, maybe, well, all the, right, about maybe even 100 sometimes, but yeah. about half of our membership would come in person. Yes. So of that, we're getting less than half joining right. in on the Zoom meetings. And right. there's only about 20, uh, I think I email, I, I snail mail our newsletters to about 27 people. So there's 27 people who aren't online. Right. Um, okay. And, and uh, people don't believe it, but the most members usually come out of all times in January. Oh, so we 90 and 100. And a lot of people say, why would anyone want to come out well, that's, you know, after the holidays, people are just so happy to get out again and meet everybody and talk to everybody. Of course, now, like all other groups, we have a big issue because at this point, you know, we were hoping to get back in person to our um, community center. We can't, although uh, they are opening up now for senior groups. But as far as uh, large groups like ours, uh, uh, so the way it looks, we'll probably have to continue with both Zoom meetings for the first part of the year. Plus, of course, uh, we do want to re register for our very large room to accommodate all our members. We don't want to lose that one, but um, that's, everybody's running into the same issue. 
at uh, you know in the new year. But you know where it's time to to start our meeting. And thank you, thank you. Is everybody ready? Thank you to Raymond for setting it up, and um, Sandy informing us, and of course, big welcome to Robert. We've had a little conversation already. Um, as he said, uh, some of you maybe didn't, you know, didn't join right away. Robert at his place in Guelph, he welcomes groups every year. So maybe one of these days we can go and all of us, some of us can visit him in person. So should we go ahead, uh, Robert? And I'm ready anytime you are. Okay. You want me to start? Sure. All right. All right, fall garden design. First, tell a little bit about myself. The easiest way to contact me is through one of these sites, uh, all with the name of Garden Fundamentals. I have a YouTube channel, a Facebook group, and a blog. Uh, the Facebook group, you're welcome to join, and we have discussions constantly about solving garden problems, and we're very particular about making sure that the answers we get are correct. Um, so that's how you get in touch with me. I'm on Facebook every day. So tonight's program, we're going to look at how to design a fall garden, and then most of the program is actually about plants, selecting different ones. Um, most of the pictures in this program, and I think all except maybe one, are pictures from my own plants and my garden. So you'll get to see some of my garden, which is called Aspen Grove. Uh, by the way, it's a five acre botanical garden at the south end of Guelph, about an acre of actual flower beds around the house, and the rest of it is partially some wooded areas and, and partially a lot of shrubs. So I have probably 500 different kinds of trees and shrubs planted on the property now. And I grow somewhere in the order of 3000 different kinds of plants. So what I hope to do tonight is to get you excited about fall gardens. So what is fall? So I kind of use a loose definition of fall. Uh, for me, September 1st is sort of the breaking point and that's the end of the summer. You know, holidays are over, people go back to school. And then whatever happens between then and snowfall is sort of fall for me. So I kind of stretch it a little bit. Uh, this is a very nice little plant. It's a obedient plant. And you probably know this plant. It's, it's fairly aggressive, so it spreads quite a bit. But this variegated version doesn't spread nearly so badly. And in fact, I just noticed this year it's, an air, it's in an area where the clump's actually getting smaller because its neighbors are getting bigger and overpowering it. So I actually have to move some of those things to mm. keep it in, in line. But it flowers nice and even the leaves look nice uh, even this time of the year. Mm -hmm. So why are fall gardens not so popular? And I think one reason is that we're tired of gardening. Uh, you know, the snow melts and it's springtime, everyone gets excited and everyone rushes out and, you know, for the first month or two, everyone's gardening and weeding and it's so much fun. And then by July, August, it gets kind of hot and gets more boring. And then by fall, everyone's busy and we just forget about fall, which is really too bad. So one of the things I did on purpose when I moved to this property uh, was I, I focused very much on having an all season garden. So I have things blooming extremely early and I still have lots of things blooming now. And we'll, we'll have a look at some of those. But I think people get tired of it, um, but they also don't design for it. So we, we can fix this problem. I mean, this week is a perfect week for for gardening, right? It's nice and warm. You can be out there in shorts and a t-shirt and there's no bugs at all to worry about. The other reason fall gardens aren't popular is that people don't go shopping in the fall. So again, we get this excitement in the spring. Everyone rushes out to the nurseries. We buy plants like crazy. We plant them and then we're, we're done for the year. 
And if you want a good fall garden, you have to go out and shop in the fall because that's when nurseries are selling fall plants. Most people won't buy plants unless they're blooming, uh, which is really kind of sad, but that's the reality. So nurseries will bring in the plants that are blooming. If you want fall plants, you have to buy them in the fall, which is really great news because most nurseries also have sales in the fall. So plants are a lot less expensive. So go out and buy some plants. The third thing is that people really don't spend a lot of time thinking about the fall garden. And so there's no special design for it. Uh, years ago, I put some garden design courses together and I sat down and said, okay, well, what is different about designing a fall garden from the rest of the year? And to be honest, most of the design principles are the same, but there are some specific things you need to keep in mind when you're designing a fall garden. And those are the things that we're going to discuss now. So one of the things we want to do, and now is a perfect time to do this, is go for a walk in the garden and evaluate things. What looks good right now? If your answer is, well, not too much, then your problem is that you just don't have the right plants for this time of year. Uh, these are some sumacs which grow wild on my property. And it's kind of weird. I, I have a six acre property and I have quite a few sumacs. And when I moved in, they were all male plants. I don't know if you know that, but you know, they're male plants and female plants, certainly in sumacs and in a lot of other uh, genus as well. Um, but they were all males. Uh, and I have nothing against males, but they don't make the flower heads, right? They don't make the berries and the berries in winter are so attractive. So I do have a few now on the property. And what I'm actually doing is pulling out the males and encouraging the females to spread a bit. I, I want to see those, those berries in the wintertime. They also make an interesting tea in the middle of winter. This is a fall picture. We've got a few asters there. We've uh, got some Rebecca's. And I mean, it's nothing special about this garden. It's just yeah, some nice plants, but nothing special. And years ago, I sat down and, and I started collecting pictures of gardens that I really liked. And then I asked myself, well, what's special about these gardens? What is it that makes me think that this picture is good and, and the other hundred I looked at were just okay. And what I came to realize is it needs to have something special in there. This is an okay garden, but there's nothing special. There's nothing that pops. And if you're going to do anything in a garden, whether it's for fall or any other time of the year, start putting in these accent pieces, what I call structures. Now let's have a look at some of these. This is a juniper I bought uh, quite a few years ago, and it's, it's this really weird tree juniper. Um, it kind of makes these branches out in really odd shapes and the, the branches all hang down. And uh, I love this plant. Now, I admit half the people that visit my garden look at it and think it's quite ugly, but I really like it. And the important thing here is it stands out. It's different than your traditional plant. And so it can become a star in that garden. It's the thing that, that you see. Here's another really nice one in, in my garden. It's a Korean fir. And I don't know what variety this is. Uh, when I moved in here, I, I found a place that had a whole bunch of uh, evergreens that hadn't been taken care of and they were going to chop them all up and I got them really cheap. Uh, brought them home and, and picked out the best ones and put them in my garden. The other ones are out back kind of for a screening effect. This one is really nice because it only grows about four inches a year and it is a fir. And the way you know it's a fir is that these cones point up. And by late August, early September, they've turned this nice blue color. So you've got this lime green leaf with this blue cone and it's just, just lovely. And then by middle of winter, the, the cone part falls away and you're left with these little sticks going up to look like little candles quite a nice tree. Nice thing is it doesn't grow too fast, uh, which is a whole other story, but 
you can basically buy an evergreen to grow at whatever speed you want. My smallest evergreen is a spruce and it grows a quarter inch per year. Okay, it's never going to outgrow the spot it has. Here's uh, my garden again in the fall. So this is maybe three weeks from now. The leaves have fallen off a lot of the trees. You can see the grasses or stars in the garden at this time of the year. And on my property, I have a lot of these, what well, everyone thinks are birch trees, but these are actually aspens. And I have one of the largest groups of aspens on private property in Guelph. And that's really why I called the, the garden Aspen Grove because of these unique trays. Um, they're great in the summer because the leaves tremble. That's why they're called trembling aspen and you can, you can actually hear the noise. Uh, and then in fall, they have these nice white trunks which stand out really nice. But you have to look at this and then you ask yourself, well, what's special about this? This is a fall garden. What makes this special? Well, okay, we've got the trees, we have an arbor there, and we have some of these large grasses and everything else kind of just blends together, right? It's, you got to have some special things in there to make this garden pop. I have a lot of stone on my property and I use it all over the place. But this one I actually bought, and it's a large quartz piece. It's about four and a half feet tall. It weighs a huge amount, and I actually had to be put in and, and placed by a truck. And it sticks out in the garden, and, and in fact, you can walk right up to it, um, depending on the time of year you're here, because I have bulbs in front of it. But in the summertime, there's, there's nothing there, and you can walk right out, and people like touching it. The other thing you want to think about is hiding the summer ugliness. So we have these beautiful plants in the summertime, but by fall they're finished and lots of the plants go brown and the, there's no flowers left and they become kind of ugly. Now you can cut some of those back if you like or plan your garden so that you're going to hide a lot of those. So I like to put plants in that then have the ugliness behind it and the nicer plants in front. Um, I mean, you, that's true of any time of the year, but in the fall specifically, you want to hide those ugly ones from the summertime. You also have to think about how fast these plants grow. And here's two very interesting grasses. So on the left here, we have a unknown grass. It's sort of a, a blue uh, festuca type grass, but it's uh, two to three times the size of a blue festuca. Uh, it's evergreen all year. It's flowering right now. It's there very early spring. It's there very late fall. And in fact, it's there all winter long and stays pretty green all winter. Now, some of the blades will go brown by spring, but most of them are still green. So it's always there. The grass to the right is a miscanthus. It's a beautiful plant. And this is probably taken uh, maybe June, late June, something like that. And it's starting to grow but it's going to be six, seven feet tall by the end of the summer. It's just a real stunner. But early on in the year, all it is is little brown stubbles. Many of these grasses are warm growers, particularly the miscanthus types. And so they only grow once it gets warm enough. So we're looking June, mid-June before they start doing anything. And before that, they're actually pretty ugly plants. So Great for the fall, ugly in the spring. So watch where you put this plant. And in fact, this has been here in this spot for a number of years and it started reverting. So it was losing the stripe on it and going green. So I took the whole thing out. I, I took a piece off that was still variegated and actually put it somewhere else because uh, this part is right beside a, a walkway and it's, it just doesn't look good in the spring there. So it, it got moved. Now it's in a place where in the spring, if it's ugly, nobody even notices because I have other things around it. Fruits and berries are a big part of the fall garden. And this is one that's spectacular. 
or so they say. I mean, all the pictures I see is this, these beautiful red berries on this plant it's called beauty berry. And I've grown this plant a number of times. I still have some in the garden. I have never gotten anything close to this. So I don't know what it is. It either doesn't like me or I don't like it, but I don't get this kind of display in my garden. Now, just so you know where I am, I'm at the south end of Guelph. Uh, we have a fair amount of clay here. Uh, pH is about 7.4, uh, zone five. And this plant grows, but it certainly doesn't look very good. So I don't know what I'm doing wrong with it. Um, but there are some really nice fall plants. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, you may not know what this is, but this is Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, it's a beautiful flower early on, early summer. And then uh, most of the time you'll get these seeds and they start out as a green head and then slowly turn this orange color. And by the time they're ripe, which is uh, sort of a first of October, they're quite red. And they are toxic, uh, but something in my garden eats these guys. So I don't know if it's the squirrels or, or the raccoons or something, but somebody doesn't think it's, it's toxic. Um, so what I do is I actually put in what we call an organza bag, a little cloth bag over top of these things. And then the animals leave it alone and then I harvest them. And I did that about a week ago. And I have a new way of germinating these things. So jack in the pulpits, they're called erysema, and there's hundreds of them available. Many of them are from Asia, um, but they all germinate in about three to six weeks. Okay, so you get the seed, every one I've ever tried germinated, and I get a very high percentage germination. So give that a try. Um, so what I did last year, I germinated them around December, grew them under lights till March, and then I put gave them an artificial winter and put them in the fruit cellar. And then I brought them back out and grew them in late summer. And the reason I did that is I, I basically squashed two growing seasons into one summer. So it makes much bigger tubers that year in one year. Um, anyways, that worked, worked quite well. Jack and a pulpit are great little plants. Lots of other things have fruits on them. And I think we'll look at a couple others uh, later on when we look at the plants. The dying leaves, again, this is the kind of thing you can go out and look at right now. These are hostas, and it really depends on the year, but sometimes these hostas get this beautiful golden color. Now, each one's a little different, and some years they just go brown, and you don't kind of skip this, but go out and pick your hostas based on fall coloration, and then maybe move some of those into more prominent spots next year. But these yellow leaves are just great. In fact, a week ago, um, my um, uh, red bud turned a beautiful golden yellow. All the leaves turn at the same time, but half of them are still on the tree, half are on the ground now. But it, it was just spectacular in the garden. So go out and have a look at those leaves. I also find that fall flowers tend to have a different color scheme. So in the summer, you get some bright colors, but you also get a lot of pastel colors. And it seems like all our fall plants are very bright things, which I think are great because I don't really care for the pastels. The, the little pink one there in front, uh, that's okay, but I don't really like the color. I love that bright yellow. And um, but it can be hard to work with in the garden. And some people really don't like bright colors. So have a look at that and be aware that many of the fall plants are bright, bright colors. All right, so that's about it. Uh, when you design your garden, uh, it's really no different than other gardens, uh, design projects. Uh, the important thing is that you get in the garden this time of year and you buy the right kind of plants for it. So let's go and buy some plants. And of course, asters are great plants. So in this picture, this front one here, this purple one, uh, or is it pink? I guess you'll call it a pink. It's called Alert, which is a really nice aster. Behind it is a yellow chrysanthemum. And I'm gonna talk about this particular chrysanthemum on this slide too. So 
one of the questions I see all the time is, you know, the nurseries have the fall chrysanthemums in, uh, they're in pots. Can I buy those and can I put them in my garden and will they come back? Well, the answer is yes and no. So the first thing to understand is that those are potted plants. They're grown and designed and bred to be enjoyed in the fall and then discarded. They're not great garden plants. So whether they come back or not depends a lot on the genetics, but a lot of ge the genetics was bred in warmer climates. And so they don't do that well here. Many years ago, I bought three of these, put them in the garden. One died right away, never came back. The second one came back one year and then died out. And this yellow one I actually had for a number of years, but I've lost it too now. Now that may be my fault. It may have gotten too crowded in this bed, but I did have it for at least 10 years. If you want to try and keep them in your garden, what you should do is buy them as soon as they're available. Okay, don't buy the older ones. You want them real fresh and put them in the garden right away. Don't keep them in that pot. You want them in that soil. You want the plant to start putting down a root system. Deadheading would probably help, but you probably don't want to do that because you're going to lose your flowers. But at least get it in the soil. If you keep it in a pot for two or three months and then plant it, there's a much lower chance that they will come back. So there's a lot of good asters. This one's Alma Potscake. This is a very old one. That's about three and a half feet tall. It's got this beautiful color on it. My one problem with this plant is that when it's not in flower, it looks like goldenrod. The leaves kind of look the same. So what I do in the spring and I'm going around and weeding out my goldenrod because I have a lot of fields of it out back and so it's always seeding itself around the garden. I never know whether it's goldenrod or an aster. You have to be very careful. So I actually have this plant marked now. I have some stakes around it so I don't pull it out in the springtime. Uh, but it's flowering right now and it's a, a great accent plant in the garden. There's lots of good perennial chrysanthemums and you don't see them around very often, unfortunately. Even nurseries don't sell a lot of these, but they are around. Uh, you could easily find a hundred different chrysanthemums that are garden hardy perennial chrysanthemums. You won't find these in, in these tight little pots with a million flowers on them, but you find them in the perennial section of the nursery. Uh, this one I've had for 15 years, Clara Curtis. It runs a little bit, so every two or three years I hack it back, but it's not too bad. It's a little bit floppy, which can be a problem with chrysanthemums. So it grows up to about three feet and then it's not really floppy, but it does kind of lean out a little bit. So one thing you can do with plants like that is come along in the middle of June and cut them back by half. That will give you a shorter plant when it flowers and the stems will be a little stiffer. But to be honest with you, this one I just leave and it, it doesn't really bother me too much. Most floppy plants I hate, so um, this one's okay. And then there's a whole bunch of asters, which are great. And uh, there's a series of these called the woods. So there's the woods white and woods pink and woods blue and purple and so on and so on. It's a whole series of these. These are all very good asters. Now there are some years where they get a disease and the plant doesn't do well and it kind of shrinks back, doesn't flower very well. And then next year it's back again. And, but when it blooms well, they're fantastic. They make this nice clump. They're only about, oh, let's call it eight inches tall. So they're a pretty short plant, um, but they've been the star in the garden for the last month. Uh, lovely little asters. There's a woods pink. Now there are very many wild asters too. And so this is a story of two wild white asters. So there was this one in the garden and I don't think I planted it. I think it self seeded itself and it grew for years. Came back every year, three and a half, four feet tall, just covered in flowers. Next year, same thing, great plant. 
Now I don't have it anymore. So I don't know if it died out or I weeded it out in the spring. It's, that's always a possibility. I do have this on the property in the wild areas, but not in the garden. Then there's another area that's not far from here in the garden. And I got this nice self-seeded white aster. And I thought, oh, great. It was a little different than this one, um, but it looked good too. And I let it flower and do its thing. And the next year, there were like a thousand of them in the bed. And it seeded around like crazy. So be very careful which wild white aster you put in the garden. And if you, if you want to have a real challenge, try and identify the white asters in Ontario. They all look the same to me and identification is very difficult. But there are some really nice wild ones. Here's some that we don't usually think of as a fall plant. It's an Artemisia. Uh, I don't have a proper name for this one either. Uh, it makes mostly gray leaves and then it makes these flower stems which are also mostly gray. Uh, in the summertime, it's an okay plant, but by fall, it's still looking great when everything else starts looking kind of ratty. So think about this. This plant actually looks pretty good most of the summer. There's not much there in spring until it starts to grow, but by early summer till frost, this is a good looking plant. Uh, smoke bush plants. Uh, this is one of my all time favorites and it's called Grace. And um, this picture just doesn't do it justice. I have a hard time photographing this plant. The leaves in the right sun are kind of an orangey color. In, in the spring when they open their orange and they stay that color. But it seems like whenever I photograph it, I end up with green leaves. But this is an absolute fantastic smoke bush except that it doesn't make a lot of smoke. This was kind of an unusual year and uh, it has a reasonable amount of smoke, which is the flowering part of it. But I grow it mostly for the leaves. And what I do now is I chop it to the ground every year and let it grow because the most colorful leaves are the fresh ones. And it will grow six feet tall. And then next year I'll cut it back down to the ground and it'll grow another six feet tall. Hellebores are becoming extremely popular. And quite honestly, I think most of them are kind of ugly, to be honest with you. Uh, the flowers hang down so you don't actually see them. Yes, they flower very early and that's unique. Um, the plants are okay, but they're not that spectacular. I'm starting to fall in love with them a little bit. I have probably 30 different ones now. But when you're looking at hellebores, if you want a neat hellebore, get this one. It's called the stinking hellebore. It has this great shape in leaves and it looks green like this all year long. I'm not kidding you. If, if we have a thaw in January and you can see the ground, you'll see this plant. It looks as if the winter hasn't touched it. In spring, it looks like this. All summer, it looks like this. In fact, it, it, it's almost boring because it never changes much. It does flower in the spring. The flowers are kind of a yellowy color. I think I have a Oh, I don't have a close up. Uh, the flowers are nothing special. So you're growing this for the plant. It's called stinking, but you don't actually smell anything unless you rub the leaves. So that's not an issue. I find it, it seems to last about three to four years in the garden and then dies out. And by that time it's made a, a few babies around. So you never lose the plant, okay? Uh, absolutely gorgeous plant. Put this beside your hosta, which have larger leaves. Uh, put it beside some yellow plants so you offset the green. It, it just works with so many things in the garden. Russian sage is a great plant, has lots of fragrance. These are available in different heights. So the traditional one is sort of four, four and a half feet tall and, and it's full of blooms right now, it looks great. You can also buy these in the one foot high versions, uh, pretty much the same plant. It does spread a little bit, but uh, still a really nice plant. And then there's lots of ferns. And this time of the year, the ferns are still looking pretty good. Many of them will be knocked down in the winter time. And so they're not so great in spring, but this time of year, they're still nice looking easy to grow, provided you put them in the right spot. So the trick with ferns is 
there are some that like it wet and some that like it dry, some that like shade and some like sun. Each one you have to look up, figure out what it likes, put it in that location and it'll do lovely for you. But if you put it in the wrong place, it will start dying out. So uh, the sneeze weeds are great. They're finished flowering now, but they seem to flower at a time when there's not much else in the garden. Again, these are available in different heights. The traditional one is a five foot plant and gets a nice bushy look to it. And now I picked one up last year that grows to about a foot, a foot and a half. Um, same kind of colorations, the yellows, the reds, the browns. This is an interesting plant. So it's called sedum neon, or at least that's what I think it's called. So if I look on the internet, I do find some plants that look like this. Uh, but I also find plants that have leaves that are much greener and the flowers are much darker. They're also called neon. So I'm not quite sure which one's right. Uh, this one, for me, the leaves are very chartreuse green. So it's a very nice light colored plant, forms a nice bush. The flowers are covered in bees. Um, it's a great looking plant. Now, three years ago, four years ago, I started noticing my main clump started having part of it come up with white flowers. So the leaves look the same, but it was white. And so here's a problem with many of these stone crop sedums is they do revert back to their parents. Um, sometimes that's a good thing. A lot of times it isn't. So a lot of these that are variegated will lose the variegation and you'll get a green growth. If you leave the green growth, you'll eventually lose the variegation. So it's important to pull out those green stems. In this case, I sort of had half pink and half white flowers. And last year, what I decided to do is I wanted to split them. So I, I cut this back and took the one side, which I knew was pink, and took a few leaves off there, actual stems. So I have a pink one. And then the other side I knew was white. I, I had a white one. And then uh, the other one I hacked in half when it started blooming this summer and tried to split it again. So, But this way, I'll have a two different versions of the plant. Now you might know these as sedums. Well, they're actually no longer called sedums. They're now called the hylotelephiums, um, which I don't think gardeners will ever use. So we'll just call them sedums. Now you might've noticed that a lot of plants are being renamed. And the reason is that in the last 10, 15 years, the sciences have been doing a lot of genetic analysis on these plants, and they're finding that, well, things that they thought were sedums are actually not sedums based on their genetics, and so they have to go back and change the names. Uh, they're moving things around. Um, there are a lot of name changes. There are going to be more of those coming. Um, unfortunately, most of the new names are really hard to pronounce, so I don't know who's dreaming these up, but uh, gardeners, I don't think, will use a lot of them. Sedums are also available in these dark colors. And I've been collecting these for a while now. And the problem with the dark colored ones is that they're not as strong. The stems are kind of weak. So they come up, they make these nice heads and then they flop just as they're flowering. And most of the red ones, I don't consider good garden plants. This one's not bad. It doesn't have a name. So I guess the thing to do is if you want one of these red ones, rather than buying one in a nursery, find someone who has a garden and one that has a good quality one, and then just pinch out a little stem out of this, okay? You can grow them from a leaf. You can grow them from a stem. If you take a two inch stem off of this and stick it in the ground, it will root and grow. They're extremely easy to propagate, excuse me. Um, but start with a plant that's worth growing rather than experimenting. Our culture comes are just finishing up. I guess they were maybe finished a week or so ago. Uh, now, a lot of people call these fall crocus, which is actually incorrect. So culture come as one genus of plants and fall crocus is something different. And you can actually tell by counting the number of stamens you have. So this is a culture common. It has six stamens. Crocus only have three stamens. 
other than that, they do kind of look the same. In fact, uh, I hate to say it, but a master gardener gave me some white colchicums. Uh, no, sorry. She gave me white fall crocus. And once they flowered, I realized, well, they're actually white colchicums. Um, now, in the, in, in the general hobby, most of people call these fall crocus. The neat thing about these is they make leaves in the spring, then the leaves go underground. There's nothing there all summer long. And then the flowers pop up in the fall without any leaves. So the leaves you're seeing here are from the daylily that's beside it, not from the plant itself. So it's an interesting plant, but you have to position it somewhere so that you know that there's nothing there all summer. You just have this big space. So try and put something there that grows in the summer and covers it and then cut it back in the fall so you can see these bulbs blooming. Uh, this is a, a, a fall uh, flowering crocus called speciosus. And there, there are dozens and dozens of these. Unfortunately, many of them are hard to buy. This is a plant I, I really love and I hate it. Uh, anemones, these are the um, fall anemones. Uh, you can see the goldenrod in the back. So this is at the edge of my property and behind here is pretty wild stuff. And the grow nice, they flower light, they have lots of flowers. This particular one has been in flower now for at least six weeks. So it's doing a great job. The problem is they spread too much, at least for me. So you have to hack them back all the time. So I bought a whole bunch of these, put them all over the garden and slowly I'm pulling them out of the garden and I'm putting them in areas where I don't care if they spread. So in places like this, they have to fight the goldenrod and the goldenrod's tough enough to take it. And so they can only spread so far. Uh, the other thing you can do with these is put them in a bit of a shady area and they won't spread nearly so fast. There are many different cultivars. I like this one called Pamina. It's a semi-double. It's a little shorter than many of them, but we're still talking about a three foot high flower. Uh, it's got a lovely color to it. Uh, so if you want one and, and you're only gonna get one, Pamina is a really good one to pick. This is my all time favorite uh, perennial and it's called Geranium sanguineum. Starts flowering early, flowers all summer long, you still have some flowers in the fall and then the leaves turn this nice coloration. I like it because it flowers so long, but I also like it because you rarely have weeds in here. This makes a pretty solid clump. It slowly spreads so about every five years. I hack it back, make it half the size and that's it. I don't do anything with this mostly. Um, very seldom I have a weed inside one of this plant. Um, comes back every year, very hardy. It's, it's an absolutely great plant. Comes in whites, pinks, stripes, some red ones are almost not really red, maybe a purpley red color. The turtle heads are great plants. See, these are Ontario natives. Um, this particular one is called hot lips and I bought it for the name. I mean, who doesn't want some hot lips in the garden? Uh, it's particularly rad, and that's one of the nice things about it. Uh, our native ones are uh, more of a white color, and I have some of those growing. Uh, they just seed it themselves. Uh, but this is a really nice one, late flowering, nice plant. This is one of my real favorites, and it is a bit hard to find in nurseries now, but this is the last plant in my garden to flower, and it's just flowering right now. It normally starts around the middle of September uh, and lasts for a good month. And it's called uh, Azawa. So this is an ornamental onion, grows about a foot tall. So it's great in a rock garden. It is a bulb. Um, the, the leaves are grassy, so you don't even notice them at, uh, most of the year. And then you come up with this, this nice coloration. So really worthwhile. And by the way, alliums, I love and hate, 
There's some great ones. And I have alliums blooming right from very early spring right to October. Uh, but there are a bunch of alliums which are thugs and seed around all over the place. So you have to be very careful which ones you pick. Now, here's another allium that is not nearly so friendly. Uh, Ramosum, nice white. Uh, it flowered a little earlier, so we're talking mid-September-ish. Uh, the problem is that it makes a seed head and then it seeds around quite a bit. Um, so what I do now is I just come along and, and cut the heads off. I don't deadhead most things in my garden, but I've learned that this one I do have to deadhead and if not, I'll be pulling seedlings up for years. But it is a nice plant. It's got a really nice clean white color. And again, it's, it's at that period of time when there's not much else blooming in the garden. So you can have a nice little clump you know, that's 10 feet across kind of thing. And you've got this splash of color. Amazonias are uh, North American natives. Uh, if you're going to get one, I recommend this one. It's called Blue Ice. It's a little shorter than most of them. Uh, the flowers are a little stronger color. It is spreading now. It, it's been in this spot for at least 10 years. And, and I've noticed in the last couple of years, it's spreading a little more than I want. So I'll be cutting this back by, by half next year. Uh, great little plant, never have to do anything to it. Don't fertilize it, you don't water it. They're quite drought hardy. Uh, you don't deadhead it, you don't do anything. It's just it's a great plant. But there's another Amsonia, and this is one picture that's not mine. Uh, I'm working towards this, and I have several plants now, but it, the clumps aren't nearly so big. Um, this is Amsonia hubrechtii. It grows to about four feet tall, three and a half feet tall. Its leaves are, are very thread-like, and then it gets this gorgeous yellow in the fall. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this display. Oh, I do have this one in here. I was just looking at this one in the garden and it's never really dawned on me so much as this year, but it's flowering right now. And I think it usually flowers earlier. Now my plant was covered up mostly by a larger bush. And so it really wasn't doing very well. And in the middle of summer, I cut the bush back to give this guy a lot of light. And I think it's rewarded me by having a beautiful display. Uh, so this is a Joe Pie weed. Um, it's shorter, so we're talking three and a half feet, maybe. Uh, probably likes to be quite wet. Um, although I just grow it in normal garden soil, has its white flowers, and I say it's, it's blooming right now. Its leaves are quite dark. That's where it gets its chocolate name. So we get white flowers on a very dark leaf and it makes a really nice display. The Acteas, they keep having a new name change every three years. So they were Semisifucas. And I think before that they were Acteas. They're now back to being Acteas. And a common name is uh, Black Cohosh. I don't know why that's a common name because it's even harder to say than Actea. Uh, this is white pearl, which is one of the last flowering ones in the garden, but they're all late flowering. So they've been doing well in the garden for the last month and they make these stems go up. You get these ball brush displays. Every one I have is, is white. Um, some of the leaves are green. Some of the leaves are quite red. It does like a little moisture and it is a little slow growing. So you buy it and put it in the ground and next year you'll probably be a little disappointed with it. Uh, you know, give it three years and it will make a very nice display. Here's a slightly different one. It's a little taller. Uh, this one grows in quite heavy shade. Um, you can see the close up of the flowers here. So what you're looking at is the main top stem is flowering and the side branches, those are just buds. So when the top is finished, the buds will be blooming. So you get a pretty long bloom period. Uh, monk's hood, uh, there are summer blooming monk's hood and fall blooming. And unfortunately, most gardeners only grow this one, which is a real shame. 
this is the, the common fall monkshood that grows four and a half, five feet tall. Uh, you might have heard that this thing is extremely toxic and you shouldn't touch it and you shouldn't have it in your garden and so on and so on. Uh, well, it is toxic, so don't go out and eat it. Don't put it in your salad, but I touch it. I don't have a problem with it. It's not that toxic. Uh, now, if you have little kids around, maybe you're a little more concerned, but um, um, it, it's a fine plant. What's really nice is that it blooms the really blue color and it blooms very late. And a friend of mine and I have been growing a number of different monkshood from seeds. And in fact, they have a new species blooming and it could be because it's a seedling but it's blooming right now so i don't know if it will do that next year a lot of times when you grow things from seed the first year that it blooms it blooms late in the year and then as it matures it blooms more in the the right time of the year uh, so we'll see but it's blooming at about a foot tall right now uh, there's a range of these they're, they're all great plants now, I grow this in full sun, which is what most books recommend. And I also grow it in uh, part shade. And I find in part shade, it actually does better. You get a few fewer flower buds, which is normal for most plants. When you take a plant that likes sun and you move it to shade, it, a lot of them will grow well, but you get less flowering. But in this case, less flowering is better because in sun, these, these flower heads are too close together. They're, they're they crammed. They don't open properly. And when I move this plant to some part shade, you see the flowers much better. So it actually does better in part shade. Uh, here's a, a series of plants, which I left in the program just to show you, but I don't actually recommend these. These are tricertus or toad lilies. And I find in my garden, they're all short lived. So they grow for three, four years, and then they peter out. Um, it's just too bad because they're beautiful plants. They flower very late. And maybe it's just my garden. So if you want to try it in different you know, conditions, I mean, go right ahead. They're, they're not supposed to be short-lived, but in my garden, they all are. But they're such gorgeous plants. There's another one. Uh, Caryopteris is a, a shrub. Uh, the top part is not really hardy here or partially hardy. So it usually dies back to the ground and, and I tend to cut it to the ground anyways. And then you get this nice growth and blue flowers late in the year. It's also available in a green cultivar, but I think this, this yellowy chartreuse leaf is much nicer with the blue. And then there's this other one, which is actually a perennial and it's called Snow Fairy. And I think every garden should have this. Um, in fact, I need to retake this picture because it's actually better than the picture displays. It comes out in early in the year. It's a perennial, so it starts growing. It has this variegation and it has this variegation right up until snow time. Late in the year, so say two to three weeks ago, it started making small blue flowers and they're kind of insignificant. Although if you get down really, really close, they're really interesting flowers. But from a distance, you hardly notice the flowers. You're growing this for the leaves, but this plant looks great all year long. Now it is perennial, so it will be killed back down to the ground. And um, then I just cut it off in the spring and away we go. Uh, this is really not considered a fall bloomer, but some years you get flowers. Uh, Lanicera, which is uh, the honeysuckle, drop more scarlet is a really nice one. Uh, it gets a bit of yellow in the leaves and can flower quite late. As you can see here, the hostas are all done and this thing's still flowering away. The Rosa Sharon's are very popular. Uh, they make shrubs and most people grow kind of a pink colored one that's very common. And the problem with Rosa Sharon is everybody says, oh, I hate this plant because it seeds everywhere. My lawn's just covered in little seedlings. Well, the problem here is you're growing the wrong plant. Why one of the new hybrids? Okay, some of these are completely sterile. They don't make seed. So you'll never have seedlings. Uh, most of the new varieties, even if they do make seed, make very few seedlings. 
So get one of these new ones and, and that problem goes away. And I think the new ones are more interesting anyways. But this is a shrub. Uh, I don't know how tall it will get. Usually once it gets over 10 feet, I tend to cut it back because I want them sort of eight to 10 feet size. So when you're looking at it, they, the flowers are in your face. Uh, this is one of our native uh, viburnums. And this particular plant was on the property when I moved in here. And the previous owners of this place were not gardeners. In fact, um, there was grass around the, the house and a few um, evergreens in the front, but that was it. So this is a native uh, plant that was there. It's quite large, uh, 18 feet tall, maybe. Gets these nice flowers on. Uh, but the real interesting thing about this is, is the berries that it gets in the fall. So right now it looks a bit more like this. Probably not quite this red yet because we haven't had a good frost. Uh, but once we get hit with a frost, I get these nice red leaves and then these berries stay on all winter long because the birds really don't like them. They're, they're quite tart and they usually get eaten in one of the last things. So it's almost spring before the birds will eat them. So you've got this bush with these beautiful red berries on it. It's a really nice viburnum. Here's a nice grass. Ah, well, I fooled you. It's actually not a grass. Uh, this is an iris, a Japanese, uh, sorry, a Siberian iris. And uh, they flower earlier in the year, but they have this nice grassy look and they actually get quite colorful in the fall. So here's a plant that's, you know, both a early summer plant and a, not a bad fall plant, which is always good. That's, uh, Siberian iris. Uh, now let's look at some real grasses. So I love grasses. Um, some of them can be weedy. Oh, this, this is a run, self running slide program. Carl Forrester is, is this one here, which I think is a great plant. The yucca beside it. Uh, these are no name grasses that a friend of mine gave me. This is a tiny one that only grows to about 10 inches tall. A large miscanthus, that's a good six feet tall. Here's the one I showed you early on. You might recognize the bridge there. We've got a little festuca. And then as the season goes along, they lose some of the coloration and they just look nice all winter long. This is uh, forest grass, which grows in part shade. This one needs to be kept moist. This is a 10 foot tall miscanthus, which is kind of rough looking, but I love big plants, so I gotta grow it. All right, so uh, some advertising. So I've written a number of books. My first one was called Building Natural Ponds. I wanted a pond without electricity, without pumps. I just wanted to dig a hole, put a liner in, fill it with water, and then forget it. And everybody said, that cannot be done. That will not work. Well, I know a fair amount about ponds and chemistry. And I thought, you know what? I can't think of a single reason why it won't work. So I built it. And that was 13, 14 years ago. And it works beautifully. I don't do anything to it except top it up. Uh, once in a while and then every three or four years I, I have so many plants in there I kind of thin the plants out maybe and that's about it. Uh, no chemicals, no pumps and it, it just is there and uh, all the animals come. Uh, there's lots of insects living in there, the birds come in and uh, eventually I wrote some articles and someone asked me to write a book and so now we have a book. Um, and we have a Facebook group. If you're interested in ponds, we have a Facebook group called Building Natural Ponds. You're welcome to join that and ask any questions that you want. My real passion in writing is garden myths. And I like to look at things that we think we know about, um, but maybe we don't. And a lot of information in gardening is wrong. I, I'm always amazed that how poor the information is that we have around there. And so what I do is I debug these things and try to get to the root of the matter. Uh, the last post, uh, by the way, I have a blog called gardenmyths.com too. You're welcome to go there. There's uh, something like six years worth of blog posts now. So all kinds of topics. 
The last one I wrote about was the way in which beans twine. Um, so do they twine clockwise or anti-clockwise? And the re I mean, it's kind of a silly topic because th this one's kind of a fun topic. But I was, I'm writing another book called um, um, Plant Science for Gardeners. And I read somewhere that the runner beans twine one way and all the other beans twine the other way. And I thought, no, nah, that just doesn't make any sense. And I found that on numerous sites, including some government sites. And so I started digging into it and it turns out it's all baloney. They, all the beans go the same way. So I don't know where these myths come from, but uh, anyways, I put a couple of books together. Each one has about 120 myths. They're completely different. All these books are available on Amazon. Uh, the book I released last year is called Soil Science for Gardeners. And it's sort of a three part book. The first part talks all about soil, learning about nutrients and pHs and all the rest of that. The second part is all kinds of tests that you can do to evaluate your own soil. And then the third part helps you go through a self remediation plan to improve your soil. And this has turned out to be quite a popular book. It's now available as a um, CD. So you can just listen to it. And the guy who did that has a much better voice than I do. And I just found out that it's going to be translated in, into Korean of all languages. So uh, it's become quite popular. Again, they're all available on Amazon. And that's the end of my talk. And I'd be happy to answer questions on anything garden related. Yes, please go ahead and ask uh, Robert uh, whatever questions you have while he's still here. I have a question about mulching. Uh, I saw wood chips in your garden, I think. Do you do a lot of that? Is that what you use mainly to mulch? I love wood chips. Um, my problem is getting enough right now. <laughs> so when, when I talk about wood chips, I put them in my ornamental beds but not in my vegetable garden. Okay, so here's, here's the problem with wood chips. They have a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So for them to decompose, they need to get a nitrogen source somewhere. And in a vegetable garden, you tend to dig a little more. So even if you're doing no dig, which is what everybody should be doing now, uh, you still dig that wood into the soil, and once it gets in the soil, it needs nitrogen and takes it away from your vegetable plants. So I don't like it as much in a vegetable bed, and there I use straw. Okay, so straw in my vegetable bed, wood chips everywhere else, and my philosophy is that I want to keep every piece of soil covered. Okay, now, ideally, you have some spots that aren't covered for our native bees, but I have enough wild areas where they'll find that kind of area. And quite honestly, I don't mulch that thoroughly, but I try to keep everything covered with mulch. It uh, means you have to water less, they slowly decompose and improve the soil, and you have to weed a whole lot less. So I wouldn't garden without it. <laughs> And how thick do you put the wood chips down? Uh, that's an interesting question. So the tradition advice is three to four inches. Okay, so if you put four inches down by next spring, it'll, it'll have compressed to about two inches. And I think that works quite well. There is some new science out that says you can actually go like 12 inches and it won't harm the soil. And that works well around trees. Not so much around perennials because 12 inches would cover the perennials too much. And when you are putting it down, ideally you don't cover your the crown of your plants. Uh, although to be honest with you, I'm not that fussy about that. But if, if you have a smaller garden, you know, don't cover the crowns. Around trees, you can easily go to six, eight inches and they won't do any harm. Now, what you don't want to do on trees is to have the mulch touching the trunk. Okay, so if you find these what we call mulch volcanoes that kind of go up around the trunk, 
Okay, nobody should be doing that, even though lots of people do. The mulch should never touch the trunk of your tree. So leave a couple inch gap there, all right? Um, perennials, I find, the, ideally you don't touch the mulch to the crown either, but I, I find them not fussy. And I, I'm not sure I've ever lost any plants because of mulching. Uh, maybe the odd one, but I, I don't worry too much. I usually have the mulch right up to the crown of the plant. And in fact, in spring, many of them will just go right through the mulch. So they don't really have a problem with it. Robert, I wanted to just tell you that I've had lost three or four of the toad lilies. So you're not the only one that can't grow them. Ah, well, good, because everything I read says they're, they're true perennials. Um, one day I'm gonna write an article about these true perennials. Um, when I started my garden, I went out, you know, bought all these perennials and I found lots of them are very short lived. Um, uh, there's an iris we were just talking about today that again, everyone that I talk to, they, they lose them after three years. So I think that the term perennial is overused by gardeners. Um, what, what is the other one? The yellow flowering, um, Coreopsis. Coreopsis is another one where I, I've tried like a dozen different Coreopsis and there are a few that are true perennials and there are others they just don't come back. And I think it's a topic that is not been well covered. There, there are certainly perennials that in our climate and our soil condition will not come back and, and they're short lived perennials, right? Uh, unfortunately, they all get sold as, as perennials and gardeners buy them, they bring them in, they put them in their garden, nothing comes back next year and they go, oh, geez, I'm a terrible gardener. I must've done something wrong. And it's, it's not you. I mean, I've tried some of these two and three times and they don't come back, right? Um, and somebody needs to put a list of those together. But it could be regional, right? Um, for instance, there's a beautiful blue poppy that we just simply cannot grow in Ontario. Um, but you can grow it in, in Quebec, which is colder. And I think that's actually why it grows there because it actually doesn't like our cold, humid winters. Whereas in Quebec, it tends to get covered in snow and doesn't have the humidity the same way. But I, I know they grow really well along the St. Lawrence and they, they will not grow here, right? So. Robert, about the uh, four inches of cedar bark mulch, would the daffodils and the tulips be able to find their way through that uh, depth of thing? Because I have bulbs in amongst my perennials. Yeah, uh, no problem at all. Uh, now, little bulbs, so uh, little like the pushkinias and so on, which are only like three, three inches tall, may have a little bit of a problem to peek your head above there. Uh, but certainly bigger bulbs are not a problem at all. Um, when, when the bulbs are growing, um, they don't actually know how much soil is above them. So they're just going to keep growing, growing, growing until they find air. In fact, one of the very interesting things about bulbs is um, they already started growing, right? So they've been making roots. They do a lot of that in September. And then uh, in October, they start making the first leaves. And the leaves come up and they stop just below the surface of the soil. Okay. Now, I read this maybe a dozen years ago and I thought, there's no way, this doesn't make any sense at all. How does this bulb know when it's almost at the soil surface? So I actually went in the garden and I started digging around all my daffodils and tulips and things. And sure enough, in every case, I found the leaves just half inch below the surface of the soil. And when you start thinking about it, that makes so much sense because they come up early in the year and they need a head start, right? So what they do is they're growing now and they're making the leaf. If you've ever grown garlic, for instance, it's the same sort of thing. The garlic starts growing and if we have a warm fall, it actually starts going, coming above the ground. Um, and that way they can have an early start in the spring and uh, get up there and bloom before all the leaves come on the trees but they'll have no problem going through mulch. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. And by the way, you don't need to use cedar mulch either. 
Uh, nothing wrong with it, uh, but um, whatever whatever is the cheapest uh, usually works the best. And I actually prefer chunky mulch, which is really hard to buy. So I like the Arbor stuff. Uh, it actually comes like in quarter inch chunks because that lasts longer and uh, doesn't pack down quite so much. Um, but the shredded stuff that they sell at most nurseries is, is fine too. Um, I've even had some arborists come to me and say, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I have some chips, but they're from pine trees. You wouldn't want those because they'll change the pH of your soil. Okay, that's a complete mess. Uh, there's nothing wrong. I don't care what kind of wood it is. Um, pines, walnuts, whatever. Um, most diseased wood is fine too, because like we have ash borer problems here. And if I get wood from an ash tree, well, my ashes are all dead anyways already, so it's not going to kill my trees. Like, you know, if, if the wood's coming from Guelph, it doesn't matter if it's disease because we have the disease in Guelph. Uh, you shouldn't be taking that wood and taking it up north to Tobermory, maybe, if, if they don't have the ash borer yet. But using what's local is fine. Um, and as long as it's wood, it's, it's a good mulch. Can I go back to, to bulbs for a moment? I have noticed that, that um, I plant bulbs and I swear they go down. Yep. They, they sink. Yeah, but you, shouldn't, it, you really shouldn't swear, okay? okay. Not, 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 <laughs> not on a Zoom, don't swear on a Zoom call, okay? You're absolutely right. So this is an interesting thing about most bulbs. They actually can move up and down in the soil. Okay, so they move up when they, so a bulb is here and they make a baby bulb, they can make the baby bulb higher. And then the next baby bulb is higher and that's how they move up. Ah. But they can also move down. So daffodils, for instance, have what they call contractile roots. So the roots grow down and they're kind of like little springs. So they, they go down and they actually pull the bulb deeper. Okay. okay? So the bulb knows where it wants to grow and it will move up and down until it's happy. And I noticed that too, all my daffodils, I plant, you know, like eight inches deep or whatever. And then eight years later, I go to dig them up because the clump's too crowded and I have to go down 10, 12 inches to find them. Right? Exactly. Well, that's because they actually want to be deeper and you planted them incorrectly. And they're saying, geez, I, that gardener didn't know what they were doing. So we're going to go deeper where we like to be. Right. So the depth you plant them isn't that critical. Uh, muscari, for instance, most of my muscari are sitting right on the soil surface. They, they actually move up. So if I plant them two inches deep in three years, they'll be sitting on the surface. Daffodils, my, where I plant them, they tend, tend to go down. Uh, the same with planting them the right way up. Okay. They don't care. You can put them upside down, sideways. They could care less. They're going to right themselves anyways. Doesn't harm a bulb. Good. Now, the other thing about bulbs is if you dig them up in June, okay, don't put them in a shed. If you can help it, plant them right away. Because as I said, bulbs start to grow in mid-August. They start to make roots. Okay, so we want them in the ground as soon as possible. The same goes for purchase bulbs. Don't, if you buy bulbs, like, you know, they're on sale now and you find a bag, uh, really cheap bulbs, that's really not a good buy because they should have been in the ground for two months already. So plant them early. Don't wait for frost. Whoever came up with that idea doesn't know what they're talking about. Buy early, plant them as soon as you get them. If you're moving them in the garden, Move them right away. They don't need to sit in a shed for the summer. And if you think about it, all the bulbs that you planted five years ago, they've been in the ground the whole time, right? They like to be in the ground, not in a shed. Robert. Oh, oh and by the way, do not put bone meal in that hole. Okay, bulbs don't need bone meal, especially around here. We have lots of phosphate in the soil. Uh, bone meal is one of those things nobody should be putting in their garden around here at all. And bulbs certainly don't need it. And just, just to tell you a little bit about my, sorry for cutting you off there, uh, a little bit about how I fertilize. Okay. Uh, I grow 3000 things. I don't fertilize anything. 
okay? You only have to fertilize if you have a deficiency. If you don't know what that deficiency is, don't put stuff on there, just plant. And uh, all the stuff grows. Now there are two exceptions. One are containers because we water them so much. We wash all the nutrients out and we don't start with soil in the first place. So we do have to fertilize containers. And by fertilizer, I'm talking organic or inorganic, whatever you want, but we have to add nutrients to that plant. And the other exception is possibly vegetable gardens because we have a short growing season. Uh, we, we can't give this guy six months to do a good job. We got to grow it in, in two and a half months. And so for vegetable gardens, sometimes you want to over fertilize just to get them to growing fast to get a crop before snow flies, right? So vegetable gardens are a little different, but all of the ornamental beds, trees, shrubs, perennials, whatever, you don't have to fertilize any of that unless you know you have a deficiency. Um, hey, Robert, I just wondered if you could expand again on the tulips. Like I've never actually taken the time to dig them out and I know I need to after a few years. Can you help me determine when I do this? Please. Well, I can tell you when to do it. I'm not going to help you. Yeah, and then come do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so um, tulips are kind of interesting. So the, the one, and I will get to your answer. Uh, the one problem with tulips is that we've now bred them for so long and we've bred a lot of interesting colors and shapes and so on into them. That breeding process has produced tulips that tend not to come back the second year. So a lot of people plant their tulips. The first year they get this beautiful display. Every bulb has a flower on it. And the next year they get a bunch of leaves and maybe one flower. And the next year it's, they're, they're kind of gone. Um, that is not a gardening mistake. That is a genetic deficiency, okay? And I'm not suggesting that the hybridizers did that on purpose, but they were breeding new fancy things that you want. And in the process, they forgot to make them perennial. So many tulips don't come back very well, okay? There are some that do. Um, um, uh, Darwin, the Darwin series come back very well and, and replicate. Um, there are a few other series around, but many of the fancier ones don't. So if you do have some tulips and they're coming back every year and they're flowering well, every year they, the bulbs split. So you start with one bulb and the next year you have two bulbs and then you have four bulbs. Um, after a while, that hole is just so full of bulbs, they don't have enough space. And what you usually notice is then that the, the size of plants comes down or the number of flowers you get starts coming down. That's telling you, dig me up and space me back out again. You can put them back in the same hole and maybe this time you throw in a little bit of compost or something. Um, but the key is you gotta get rid of most of them. So you'll, you put 10 in and five years later, you dig them up, you've got 50. Okay, you got to get rid of 40 and put just 10 back in. And then they'll be fine again for another five to 10 years. Uh, so I grow mostly daffodils because I have deer and wild animals that eat my tulips. Um, but, you know, and, and it depends on the cultivar. Sometimes it's four years, five years, they start declining. But as soon as you start seeing decline, fewer flowers, smaller plants, you got to dig them up. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and it's quite simple. Dig them up, um, put a few back in that same hole, cover them up, and then do something with the rest of them. Okay, thank you. Okay. And what I generally would do is I keep the biggest ball. If, if, if you're going to get rid of them, keep the biggest bulbs because they're the ones that are going to flower for sure. The smaller baby bulbs take a few years before they bulk up and get big enough to flower. So go through them. Anything that you cut with a, when you're digging them up, throw it away. Uh, anything that's kind of shriveled, throw it away. Keep the best ones, put them back in the hole. You know, you can throw a bit of compost in there if you want. Uh, cover them up and, and you're done. Robert, I just want to get back to tree mulch. We have a lot of trees, including black walnuts, spruce trees, and others. Yep. And every uh, few years, get someone to come in and they cut, cut the dead branches out. 
yeah. and have a machine and we keep the mulch and we spread it under the trees. Now yeah. talking about spreading, is it okay to, since they are our own trees, spreading it back under the same trees? Sure. Yeah. And what about, you mentioned that not to do too close to the trunk. Is that only for bought uh, mulch and not our own? No, that's that's for everything. The, oh. the problem is that the mulch keeps the trunk wet. Oh. And so some trees will develop a, a rot under the bark. So you want the trunk of the tree to be dry right I that's see. why you're doing it and I it see. applies to all trees now okay. many trees don't actually develop that rot but some will so it's just a good practice mm -hmm. you don't want the trunk of the tree wet you want it dry all the time so a, a ring around it a couple inches around don't mulch there okay great that makes sense thank you Any more questions? Yes, please. Um, Carrie Terrace, I'm not sure how to say that, but you say you cut yours back every year? The Caryopteris? Yeah. The, the, the show? Uh, I do. Um, so the second one I showed you, the Snow Fairy, is a perennial and it will die back to the ground anyways. So, um, and re sprout. So that one you pretty much have to cut back. The, the shrubs in my garden are sort of semi-hardy. Uh, like the, the roots are hardy, but the above stuff is kind of semi-hardy. So if I have a cold winter, they kind of die back on their own. If I have a warmer winter, they, they will have some of the above branches that survive. And, but they usually look kind of ratty. So I just know that I might as well just cut them back. And as I'm going through the garden cleaning up, I, I just cut them back. So the other option would be to just leave them and see what they do. If they leaf out higher up, you can leave them. I, right. I have a little bit of die back, but not very much. Yeah. It's just, um, the shrub is getting bigger though as well. Yeah. Uh, is, there way to, is there a way to divide that shrub like any other or? Uh, so as a general rule, dividing shrubs is always iffy. Okay, and um, I, I wouldn't normally try and do that. The Caryopteris, you might get away with it. So some shrubs, you if you take a spade and split them in half, both halves will grow. But uh, I usually don't recommend it. What I would do though, is layer it, okay? So um, take one of the branches and bend it down close to the soil. And you may have to take one of the uh, one of the new soft ones coming out, but you have to find one near the ground somehow and bend it down and just put a rock on it. Okay. Okay. And uh, you can dig it in maybe half inch if you want. It doesn't really matter, but put a heavy rock on it and just leave it for a year and you'll have a new plant. And then I would move that new plant wherever you want. That way, you know, you're not going to lose the mother plant. Okay. And Caryopteris root quite easily. So you won't have any trouble doing that. All right. I love that plant, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very nice, do you, you have the green one or the chartreuse one? The green one. The green one? Yeah, they're a great plant and there are very few fall flowering plants, right? So it's a great addition to the garden. Any more questions? No, nobody? And uh, your presentation is being recorded and as uh, you suggested for one week. Okay. And um, Sandy, I think uh, we agreed on as of November the 1st, did we? Yeah, we won't put it up till November 1st because people won't get yes. notice of it till the next newsletter. So exactly. it'll be up for the first week of November. Sure. Okay. Okay, if that's okay. Yeah, that's and, fine. Uh, we sure hope to, once uh, we get back to normal and bus tours, <laughs> sure like, love to see your property and where you are, and maybe we can do it one of these days again. Yeah, I've seen it. It's beautiful. 
Oh, you've yeah. seen it. I've Thank seen you. it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, if you're My, coming, um, yeah. If you want to organize a trip down here, a friend of mine uh, who's also a master gardener lives like five, 10 minutes away. And she also has quite a large garden. And uh, she's pretty open to having visitors as well. So if you take those two gardens and go up to the university, maybe the Arboretum, Arboretum you, have a, yeah. you have a full trip right in Guelph, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so. Great. Okay. Well, anything else? Uh, should we ask a few more or should we uh, cut it off or leave? Or it was very enjoyable. Certainly a lot Thanks. of great explanations. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Robert. Okay. Thanks Hope very much. Again. And thank Have you, a... Raymond. Have a good